When you're working on a software project, you normally have a working directory with a number of files that you're working on. And these files usually can be uh, split into two categories. There are what I call here source files. These are the files that either you are directly working on, the kind of files you work on in an editor or files that may have been provided by outsiders uh, to your projects, or also the results of experiments uh, that are not easy to reproduce. And they all have in common that this is actually where the, the value of your work is, where your work went into. And that's typically what you keep in a version control system. In addition, your working directory will be full of automatically generated uh, files. And these, ideally, you should be able to delete at the end of every working day because next morning uh, you want to have a mechanism to be able to reproduce them at any time. You also want to record how exactly you did produce these files. So these files may be, uh, for example, object files or executable code output from a compiler. So you may want to record how exactly you produced them, which compiler did you use, what command line options uh, did you use, uh, what exactly were the input files that went into uh, the compilation that produced these output files. And this not only refers to compilers in the strictest sense uh, for programming languages, but also other file format conversion tools, document formatting tools such as uh, LaTeX or TROF, uh, but also post-processing steps for experimental data, all the many steps how you get from experimental data to the diagrams that you may publish in a scientific paper or in a thesis. Uh, you want these to be reproducible because at some point you may discover, oh, there was something wrong in this experiment. I have to rerun the experiment. And then it's nice if you can just press a button, enter a single command line, and all these post-processing steps will be re-executed um, re on this data in exactly the same way as previously. <clears throat> also source code uh, generated by other programs and externally provided files uh, that are available in some archival form where you're pretty sure you can download these. Again, you don't have to archive them uh, locally. All of these are uh, what I would describe as derived files. And a mechanism for describing how you generate derived files from your source file is known as a build utility and one of the most commonly used and perhaps one of the oldest is the make uh, utility that was developed with Unix operating system. Uh, and make is a command line tool that reads a configuration file called make file. You can uh, write make file either with an uppercase M or with a lowercase M, or if you're using the GNU make tool, you also can write a GNU make file. Um, uppercase M is commonly used because if you use ASCII sorting, that propels the file to the top of the output of the ls command. What does a make file contain? It contains a description of which files in your project are derived, what files are they derived from, and what shell command lines have to be used to derive these files again. So a target is a derived file and each target in a make file has one or more prerequisites. Um, can in some cases have zero prerequisites, but may have uh, zero or more prerequisites, I should say. And then this is followed by a list of commands and these commands will typically read the prerequisites and then output files uh, where the file names are these targets here. Um, <clears throat> one warning here about the syntax, um, make files are one of the very few file formats that I know where the tabulator character actually has a semantic uh, or syntactic meaning. Um, namely, all these commands that are part of a make file rule uh, have to start with a tab character. That's how you distinguish a 
shell command line in the middle of a make file uh, from these uh, target rules. So a common mistake with make files is that you look with cat or less in a terminal window at another make file and then you copy and paste uh, some lines from a make file over into your own make file and this copy and paste in particular out of a terminal emulator will typically not preserve the tabulator character. It will replace the tabulator character with the uh, equivalent eight space characters and this is not an equivalent replacement uh, in the syntax of a make file. So what does a practical example of a make file look like? Um, here we have a simple C compiler invocation uh, that reads a demo.c source file and outputs uh, an executable called demo. It calls a compiler and it has a couple of command line options. The prerequisites are not all obvious from this command line because if you look inside demo.c you may find there a preprocessor statement include demo.h to include some header files that may define related uh, constants and the function signatures of exported functions. Therefore we record here that this demo file actually depends on both demo.c and demo.h. Then we have here a second rule that explains how to produce the data.gz file and that has a prerequisite the demo file that the previous uh, rule produced as a target and it calls that file and then compresses the standard output of that executable when it's running and calls the result data.gz. Now what does make do if we call on the command line make space data.gz? It first looks at this rule and it checks is there already an existing uh, demo dot, uh, uh, an existing demo file and it also goes back and checks uh, for this demo file is this demo file newer than all of its prerequisites. If, it's, if this file does not exist or if this file is older than any of its prerequisites, then make first runs this line here in order to update this target. And once this target has been found up to date, uh, then it can uh, check whether uh, this target here exists and is newer than uh, its prerequisite. If not, then this line here is run. So make, if you ask make to build this target, it will automatically rebuild any of these prerequisites. For example, if you had just a successful uh, make run for this target and now you edit demo.h, then both of these lines, first this one and this one will be executed to make sure that your latest changes in here are reflected in the output of this executable. So you call make normally with a uh, list of the targets that you want to build. If you don't provide any targets on the command line, then simply the targets of the first rule will be built. The previous example was a very short one, but in a real world example, you will have many repetitions of such rules and you will then quickly spot some commonality that you may want to factor out in variables. So you are able to define in a make file variables. For example, here we have CC is the C compiler used, which we set here to the GNU C compiler. But if your organization suddenly decides it no longer wants to use the GNU C compiler, but the Clang compiler uh, from the LLVM project, then this is a single line change here. Maybe the compiler requires some different um, option syntax, or maybe you want to play around with different optimization levels, then again, you can set this here in a single line. And then uh, this is how you refer in a make 
file to the content of such uh, variables. In addition to these uh, named variables, which work similar to shell variables, even though the access syntax is slightly different, so you use here round parentheses, unlike you use the curly parentheses in parameter uh, substitution in the shell. Um, but there are also um, automatic uh, variables uh, that automatically get their value set by context information from the particular rule. So if you want to refer in one of these command lines, for example, to the name of the target, you can write just dollar at, and that will expand in this rule here to demo. You can also refer to the name of the first prerequisite, demo.c, with dollar less than, and you can similarly refer to the names of all prerequisites with a dollar plus sign. So this is the same rule that we've seen before. This will expand to GCC minus G minus O, um, minus capital O, then minus lowercase o demo, and then demo.c here. And here we're calling again demo. This is the first prerequisite. And the output is redirected, as you might expect, into the target. Um, because the dollar sign is a meta character in a make file, uh, don't forget that if you actually want to pass on a dollar sign to the shell, you have to uh, enter it as two dollar signs. So this is the main obstacle whenever you try out one of these command lines that you find in a make file by copying and pasting it into the shell. Don't forget that uh, any double dollar signs you then have to replace with a single dollar sign. And uh, finally, um, make also allows so-called implicit rules where you don't fully specify the name of the target and the prerequisites, but you just provide a file name pattern. The most common commonly used way of using implicit rules is uh, by referring to file type uh, extensions. So for example, uh, this is a rule that reads a uh, GIF file and then uh, converts that into a so-called embedded postscript file. So this is an older um, pixel graphics file format and this is a older file format that might be needed by some document publishing systems as the only file format they accept for incorporating uh, figures into the output. And <clears throat> this particular command line makes use of uh, another useful set of tools the, known as the PBM tools. Um, this is an open source package that consists of a large number of conversion modules between one graphics file format and another one. And they have this sort of common denominator file format, which is a very simple uncompressed ASCII-based uh, file format for graphics files. And you can convert any file format into this common format and then the common format back into any other format. And this rule here, unless there is an explicit rule that provides a full uh, target name, uh, this rule will match any targets that end in the suffix .eps and then the prefix of that file name uh, has matched this percent sign. So this will be substituted here into this percent sign. And then we have to use these automatic variables to access the actual file names that occur here in the target and in the prerequisite. Here's an exa another similar example where instead of a GIF file, we uh, decompress a JPEG file. Make has actually quite a lot of these implicit rules built in. So for example, make knows that you can produce a .o file if you have a uh, similar, uh, the same file name, but with a .c extension, then you just call the C compiler as specified in the CC variable with the minus C option and give it the C file and you get the corresponding O file out. And there are also flags here, uh, C flags is for the compiler and CPP flags is flags that are intended for the C preprocessor. 
Another thing to know about makefiles is that it's quite customary to add rules for so-called phony targets. A phony target is a target like make clean, where the intention is not actually to build a file called clean. In fact, you don't want a file called clean to exist in your working directories, otherwise this might not work. Uh, this is just a way of uh, archiving inside your make file a set of commonly used uh, shell script lines. In this example here, if at the end of the day you want to clean up, you want to delete all editor backup files, backup files from other editors, all the .o files, all the targets that you've built, all the core dumps that your processes might have left after a day's work of debugging, uh, then you don't have to remember this entire line. You just type make clean and it's just there. So you can use a make file also as a repository of commonly required uh, short uh, shell lines. So very common make targets are make clean, make test, or make install. For example, uh, when I update the PDF file with the slides for this course on the course materials web page, I do not manually type the rsync command that's needed to get this onto the website. I just type make install after any uh, typo that I might have, may have fixed in the slides and it will automatically be installed in exactly the same way as it was installed last time. So the goal of using a tool like Make is also reproducibility. Uh, you want to uh, apply each time exactly the same command line arguments. You want to not forget any particular intermediate step that may also have to be executed after you changed a particular file. You just want to be able to go into the source file make the correction that you discovered is necessary and then you type make, make test, make install and everything is being rebuilt uh, from scratch exactly as last time. This is what a reproducible build process should look like.